Welcome to Ask the FM Doctor, an interactive web series brought to you by the Simplark Foundation and IFMA to help you navigate the complex and ever-changing world of facility management. Whether you're a seasoned professional or a newcomer to the field, you'll find valuable insights and tips to deliver a better experience for your stakeholders while saving money. Join us on the third Tuesday of every month at 1 p.m. Eastern U.S. time to learn from our FM docs while connecting with other facility managers from around the world. Register today at simplerfoundation.org forward slash FM hyphen doctor so you don't miss an upcoming session. So our topic today was easy picking, saving time and money and gray hair, all important gray hair and hiring the right vendors for the various uh, types of services and contractors that we may outsource to as FM uh, professionals, always part of our uh, responsibility here. And again, I mentioned that uh, for the Simplar Foundation, procurement is one of the, the big research areas that we do in addition to facilities management. So it is possible you've seen some of this before if you've uh, interacted with Simplar Foundation in the past. Um, but without further ado, let's dive in. We'll chat about the importance of kind of hitting it right with each of our outsourced services and contracts and why that matters so much. We'll give a few recommendations for uh, your consideration the next time you're going out to purchase external uh, services or project uh, responsibilities. And we'll close things out, do some Q&A. And again, stop me with any Q&A if you have it throughout. First goal that we want to cover is with any set of outsourced services or projects we're bringing in external resources to our organization the first and really only goal in the procurement process is to make sure that our organization is represented in such a way that we are appearing as a client of choice to those external uh, entities uh, if you've seen us before you know this is a big mantra of ours we want to be the type of clients where the external service providers are sending us their best teams, their best people, their best pricing, uh, their best proposal and project approaches. And we've got to present ourselves a little differently than perhaps the average client that they see in order to get this to happen. Um, and that's a lot different than just having a purely good scope. So you see our, our funny picture here, right? Look how great the specifications and requirements were there versus the service provider coming in and trying to get that job done. Um, there's different challenges around scoping. There's also challenges around how we solicit and select our external service providers to partner with. And if we're overly price focused, I know that uh, money and financial constraints are, are always a challenge, but if we're overly price focused in that upfront procurement and proposal promise, there's always someone who will pretend that they can dive lower and the result can be as pictured here. Uh, one of the fundamental challenges that we have in the procurement process is if we're the client group and we issue our RFP or whatever solicitation, and there's a number of different vendors who come in who could perform the particular services or project that we are procuring, ultimately their proposal comes back and it's giving us some promise. They can be this fast or this high quality, or they can be this cheap or whatever the combination is that they're promising to us. And we're stuck trying to pick based upon those promises who the best vendor proposal is for our specific need. We go through that procurement process. We pick however we pick. We've identified our one up here. It's the second one from the top. We invite them forward into contract negotiations to get the final ink on the signatures. And a lot of times what you'll notice during this process is the group that we are talking to, like the actual people representing the vendor team or company at this stage of the process is we're talking to executives and sales representatives, uh, business management folks, and so on. And once that contract is signed, once the ink has just gotten dry, a lot of times what happens is they disappear. And then unfortunately, in comes a project team who may or may not have been involved in that upfront process to begin with. And that becomes a huge, huge issue because nothing will cause gray hair like hiring the wrong team who's actually going to perform those services or implement that new thing or run that project that we are externally uh, soliciting for. So that's kind of the stakes in the background and how some of the traditional challenges can pop up in the procurement process. So go, go through three recommendations here. Uh, we're going to 
think through that idea of client of choice a little bit further and be cognizant of different vendor perceptions. We'll chat briefly on how to organize and simplify your RFPs. Um, and some other things you can do as you do that transition step between the RFP evaluation process to identifying your, your top ranked external supplier or vendor, and then getting them inked into the contract for success. So we'll go through all those together. The other thing I'll mention is we're gonna try to run through this fairly quickly um, to, to make sure we have time for all of our normal agenda items here today. Mm -hmm. We will close out at the end with some additional resources and other areas to look at if you want additional uh, procurement uh, background topics or specific information. So we do have that coming at the end as well. So tip number one, uh, as mentioned, let's be aware as a client of how our vendors and suppliers may perceive us as we solicit their proposal and eventually their, their subsequent services. To do this, we do need to think in the shoes or from the perspective of a proposing supplier or vendor. If the perception exists out there that we as the client or the owner has a favorite vendor that we usually select for these types of services, or maybe it's the same small group of firms that we tend to work with. So you know, the, those who are on the periphery may not wanna participate, of course. If it feels like there's not a fair chance or a clear chance of how we're going to be evaluated if I'm proposing, that's a challenge. Are we asking the vendors and suppliers to submit too much information? That's gonna be a challenge. If it's just too much work uh, relative to the value of the contract, then I'm gonna have doubts as a uh, proposer on whether I should spend the time. And there's a bunch of other things, right? Is that RFP and solicitation and its scope confusing? Is it hiding information? Is it sweeping things under the rug? Um, and then are we the type of client who might be micromanaging, who says that it's our way or the highway, we don't want innovative ideas. I know no one would outright say we're not looking for innovation and new ideas and expertise from our uh, external partners, but oftentimes that is the message that can get inadvertently delivered in our RFP mm -hmm. and scoping documentation. So, you know, all of those types of questions have a substantial impact on you as the vendor who's proposing on an RFP, right? Um, all of that can be challenged. The, the type of unfortunate effects it could have is I could choose as a vendor not to propose at all uh, if, I'm, if I'm thoroughly or sufficiently spooked by any of those questions. Uh, maybe I decide to propose, but I'm not going to spend that much time on putting together a quality proposal. I'll, I'll throw my name in the hat, but I'm not gonna get wedded to this and really dip a lot of time in there because let's face it, it is expensive for service providers to put together a detailed proposal, get geared up for presentations and demos and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot going on. Uh, and then also the more that the client and their scope scares me or spooks me, the more I may increase my price, pad some extra contingency in there. And so now this RFP or solicitation process has negatively affected the FM organization because by the sheer nature of how we're approaching the scope in the RFP, we may have inadvertently caused the suppliers to raise their prices. So it's no longer as good of a deal for our organization as well. And really the, the way to sum all of this up is just to show this image and say, there's a lot of fish in the sea from a vendor's perspective right now. Times are busy out there. That could change. We, we go through various economic and business cycles, but right now vendors are busy. There are plenty of clients out there who have needs. And so the assumption that, hey, we're a client, we have money and we have a project, therefore all of the vendors and suppliers will come to us. It's just like throwing some some food out there in this busy, uh, you know, coral reef perhaps, um, and then everyone will come. That may not be true. Just having money and project opportunities may not be enough given current economic realities. And so we have to think of other ways to differentiate ourselves as a client. And thankfully, the procurement and RFP process is one of those areas that we can pretty quickly and easily differentiate ourselves as a client of choice. Uh, we've also looked at some some data, different ways of doing this. This was for a particular uh, state entity where we had gone out on a, a kind of a side research endeavor to ask their suppliers, contractors, and vendors, hey, what's your perception of us as a client? And again, this is for a specific uh, state that shall not be disclosed. Um, and some of the things that were found as feedback, you know, of course, 
surprised us. Got a number of contractors and suppliers to respond. Two thirds believed that the procurement process that that particular organization used was not fair, or maybe just not fair to them for some reason. Three quarters believe that that entity uh, was not concerned about overall value, innovation, and expertise. That, in other words, this client was focused on lowest initial promise of the price, uh, despite what else might be stated in the RFP documents. It seemed that when push came to shove, the perception out there in the vendor marketplace was this is a low bid price focused clients, regardless of what is written in the solicitation document. And overall satisfaction with how that organization was procuring was, was fairly low. Um, so this type of self-awareness, although it can hurt, uh, is something that we need to keep in mind as a client organization. Are there things that we are doing in how we are soliciting external work that are causing those kinds of uh, perceptions? And unfortunately, we, we cannot trick or mislead vendors and, and kind of look like a good client or client of choice while actually behaving differently. Um, vendors are very sensitive, we have found, to how clients are treating them, the processes that clients are using to compete and solicit them. And so if we look dangerous in any way, shape, or form, especially in today's busy marketplace, those vendors can, can disappear and move on to seek other less risky uh, or more attractive client opportunities. So begs the question, how do we start attracting more higher quality vendors uh, and vendors in general right now? It's, there's, it's very possible that there are those of you who are uh, on the call with us here today that are saying, we're, we're just struggling to get even responses in general, but given how busy things are or because of our geographic location or whatever the case may be, times are, are a little bit tough. We're, we're seeing a lot of that now where uh, various client or buyer organizations are saying we're seeing dwindling uh, response rates to our, our opportunities. And it does start with our solicitation. So that brings us to the topic of a few quick tips to organize and simplify uh, your, your RFP process and documentation. That's the first thing to look at. Um, I will mention the Center for Procurement Excellence, which is a, an RFP and procurement focused group that some of you may be aware of, does have an RFP report card that you can go and you can fill out um, how your standard solicitation documents kind of match up to what they would recommend as best practices in RFPs. Uh, you can see that it's just a quick two-pager on there. It calculates things. We've done some background uh, assessments of, of different facilities-related RFPs that we have found just kind of out there in the ether and found that oftentimes it's about 60% or so of the best practices are, are hit, which qu means quite a few are missing. Gets you a kind of a, a lower grade there, but it just means easy, low-hanging fruit opportunities to improve our documents. If that's a, a report that you would like to see, we can shoot you that uh, kind of two-page tool. Just request it in the chat or put your email. We'll try to grab that uh, in the chat transcript. Happy to send that to you and you can peruse it and, and just grab your last several RFPs and see how they stack up and see what ideas it might give you to improve things. Uh, we'd also recommend a particular structure to your RFP. I won't spend tons and tons of time going through that today, um, but it'll be here on the screen and it'll be uh, active in the slides and recording afterward that gets posted. But it's making sure that our RFP documents are organized well, we're not mixing and matching the different sections, making them easy to follow, uh, that can be helpful as well. Another topic, I don't mean to sound negative with it, but why is it that there are so many RFPs that are kind of poor out there or getting that lower grade on the RFP uh, report card? That's a topic to uh, consider as well. Well, you know, why do those things go out the door? Why do client and owner groups issue RFPs that may not live up to best practices, let's say? Well, one just might be a lack of experience. That's possible. Um, and specifically for us here uh, in, in the FM world, we have to wear so many different hats. Uh, we have so much going on that, you know, also being expected to be an RFP expert, you know, that's a lot. There's a lot there that there are uh, professional jobs known as uh, procurement specialists and supply chain analysts. And that's a full-time job. And it's just another thing that gets put under our responsibility in the FM world. And so 
maybe it's just been a little while since we've run an RFP or an RFP for this particular type of project or service. Um, that's something that we do see is that it's just, it's been a little while and we're rusty. We've got to brush up on things. We've got to know wh what resources to go to to get spun up again. Uh, other times, uh, surprisingly, it's that there's too much RFP experience and we're hindered by that thoughts, that the dreaded quote of this is the way we've always done it. Uh, and, and don't want to tweak things, which can lead to you know, some resistance to change, or we're too busy right now, we'll do a better job on the next RFP, but this one needs to go out yesterday, so we're under the gun, we're, we're behind schedule, just go, 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 that need for speed becomes a major challenge with RFPs, and hey, just get it out the door, we can't take the time to make this perfect, we just got to get going, um, and all of that matters, right? Now, I'll go through a few other tips to, to consider here uh, in awarding to expertise. One thing we want to, to mention here is in an RFP process, and I'm going to give you a few tips from uh, something called XPD or Expertise Driven uh, Procurement Delivery. Uh, one of the tips is to minimize paperwork, right? So how much information do we need to see from the proposal responses of our vendors to know whether they're a good vendor or not. Because that's really the goal, right? Is attract the best vendors and suppliers to propose, uh, figure out who is the best amongst those competing proposals, and then move forward with them. And one of the things we've already mentioned as a roadblock to getting more quality proposals is if we're asking for too much and too much paperwork, let's narrow it down. So I'll give you a, a tip to think about here is yes, Every vendor who proposes is going to say, we are great. You should give us the business. We are awesome. And here's why. And so we're trying to parse through the reality of everyone's going to propose and say that they're awesome. How do we really see a difference there? So one thing we found that works pretty well is the ability of the specific project team individuals who are proposing back in response to our RFP from across the vendor pool. It's the ability of those project team individuals to identify, prioritize, and minimize potential risks in executing our specific scope of work. Give you a quick example. Uh, this would be for a construction project, but you can you know, impute this type of thinking uh, to any type of uh, pr procurements that you are uh, going out for. This is just for illustrative purposes. So we're asking as part of the proposal response with page limits and keeping it short and sweet and simple, hey, we don't need a big behemoth of a proposal from our vendors or suppliers. What we actually want is them to assess our scope and tell us where they see risk or challenges or constraints or concerns with how they're going to execute that scope if they were the privileged supplier who gets the work. So this was for a uh, residence hall. Uh, and I'm going to go through an example of some of the proposal responses that came back to that ask that we had. Hey, what, what risks, what challenges, what concerns uh, do you see? Well, in this case, our budget was tight on the project. So the vendors came back and, and the different teams were proposing what their solution was. So I'll go through a few of them. Team one, we'll optimize the building location, hybrid design uh, processes, uh, you know, very fluffy words here. We'll continuously verify the budget. That's how we'll, we'll do things. So there's no plan there, right? They're just giving us general stuff. Hey, we acknowledge that the budget's tight. We'll figure it out as we go. Next team. The owner can be assured that the budget is not actually a risk. We've got a world-class team. In other words, we are awesome. We also partner with great suppliers. We'll make sure you get good prices. So yeah, it's a risk, but we're awesome. So don't worry about it. Not much of a plan. Doesn't exactly instill me with too much confidence. Uh, the winning proposal in that case said this, very factual. Hey, owner, your budget cannot accommodate all the building program that you're asking for. Here are some options uh, of the most likely areas that we can try to get this project back within the budget. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we would recommend. Mm -hmm. And all I'm thinking as I'm looking at this type of a response, if I'm the owner of the client and the evaluation team, I'm just thinking, who would I rather invite forward to an interview or to a contract negotiation process? Who's adding clarity and comforts in that I'm gonna hand them my project, which does have this budget challenge. Everyone has agreed on that. Who's going to help me solve that and overcome it? So that's one tip to think about is if you're gonna ask a, a particular question uh, in your RFPs or in your interviews, things like that, consider asking, hey, what challenges do you see as a vendor team in meeting our, our scope of work? What's your recommended solution for those things? Uh, walk me through your actual plan. 
uh, from there, uh, once you're into the, the contracting uh, process, uh, the next steps would be to have what we call more of a, of a clarification meeting, make sure they lay out exactly how things are going to happen prior to signing that contract. I'll give you a quick uh, example, which uh, we've shared before, some of you may be familiar with, but it's a great example for uh, showing the uh, value of asking vendors for their solutions, their approaches, and then making sure we get that dialed in prior to signing the contract itself. So uh, this project example, uh, you can see this is there's a bunch of water here. This is on an island off the, the coast of Alaska, actually Kodiak Island, it's a launch facility. Uh, they had a mishap that had to get repaired. So we had to repair the facilities here, uh, was essentially the scope of work, rebuild the launch facility, uh, rebuild their, their warehousing space, that was uh, the project. So to zoom in on that a little bit more, it doesn't quite do justice to the scale of it, but it's a pretty good sized effort. Um, one of the things that we had in the scope for this uh, particular project, try to get my uh, colored pen out here, is the RFP and the scope of work said that because this was on, in a very windy environment. So this particular island off of Alaska had 60 to 75 mile an hour sustained winds at any, any time. And so what we were worried about is, especially here on the launch facility, any workers who are gonna be at height doing repair work, both structurally uh, and to the envelope of the facility, we were worried about their safety, uh, essentially is what the client was worried about. So the way that the specification was, was written for the workers who are gonna be at height is it was said, hey, Let's go ahead and enclose 360 degrees all the way around this facility. I'm gonna draw my nice X bracing scaffolding. Let's enclose the facility and scaffolding. We'll wrap it, we'll cover it. So it's an enclosed environment around the launch facility. Um, and that will protect the workers from winds. And that's the safest way to do the project. So that was in the RFP's scope. So every vendor who's proposing, in this case, contractors proposing in response, they all have to adhere to that spec. Now. One of the things about being a client of choice is being open to the idea that there may be a better way to do the project or perform the work than we even specified in the RFP. And so another evaluation criteria for your consideration is have an open area of the proposal that says, dear vendors, contractors, suppliers, if you were the emperor of the world, if you were the client, if you were us, is there anything you would change about the scope, the specifications, or the project needs to deliver a better outcome? What would you recommend, in other words? And in this particular project, one of the contractors came back and said, hey, if we can delete the specification for the scaffolding, we can do this uh, faster uh, and safer and will be cheaper. And what we'd propose is we actually have our project teams, as shown in the pictures, tie off to structural uh, members and essentially rappel down and work at height that way. Um, and that's what we'd recommend to be cheaper, faster, and safer. Now, initially this client reacted in a negative fashion and said, there's no way that that's gonna be safer. There's no way that we would ever allow anyone to do that type of work. Uh, that's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna stick with our original specification. But if we could do this idea, it would be a good idea. So. You probably should give them credit in at least this area of their proposal response. They took the time to recommend a solution that was more innovative. Um, they're thinking about our specific project needs. So that's a good thing. Now we invited them forward, uh, asked a little bit more questions about this in an interview process, and it got us even more intrigued as the, the client group who was evaluating us started to seem more real. Um, as much as we had initial doubts and concerns about the safety and validity, validity of it, this vendor ended up actually winning the competition. And so we invited them into a, a contract negotiation stage and we asked them, asked them, excuse me, to substantiate this plan and idea. These pictures were actually what were submitted as part of their clarification package prior to signing the contract where they said, hey, this is how we do most of our work. And we do this on offshore oil rigs in way worse weather. That's why you can see these pictures are all over the open water rather than on the island that I was showing you for our project. Um, so these pictures are from prior work that this contractor had done. And they said, here's our safety record with this type of work. We know that this is the right way to do it. We do it in worse weather conditions and not even on nice solid green ground. Uh, this is the way to do it. And so at that point, we're going through that whole clarification process. We're verifying it. We're getting that written into the scope instead of our initial expectation because it was all fair and square with how it was submitted up front in the proposal. And ultimately, 
the project did finish ahead of schedule, no issues with it. And we did save uh, quite a bit of money uh, going in that direction as proposed in that solution from the winning contractor. And then of course I got the nice marketing pictures of what it looked like uh, in the end. So a successful project, all because we were open as that client to ask the question, is there a better way to do this than we even knew how to ask for it up front? So a couple other ideas there to, to keep in mind. In conclusion, in facilities, we are serving many different business units, typically uh, internal to our organization, which comes with a wide variety of project needs. There's various construction needs, engineering needs, professional services, technology, ongoing annual maintenance operations, and other business uh, needs that we have. We are typically pulled in to help write the scope um, but we're also pulled in to help be subject matter uh, experts in the evaluation process oftentimes. And so keeping some of these tips in mind about that client of choice mentality, um, trying to minimize the amount of paperwork and you know, burdensome nature of our RFP process is going to be a big thing that we want to keep in mind. And don't forget that it's okay to leverage the expertise of your external contractors, suppliers, and vendors who propose in response. Don't forget to ask that question of them. Hey, if you were the client, is there anything that you would do differently? Um, all of those are tips that we'd recommend. There's a much more that can be said on this topic, but in the interest of time, I'll just point you to some other procurement resources. First up is a big shout out to IFMA themselves. Uh, one of their latest research and benchmarking reports is the Facility Manager's Guide to Procuring Technology. So this would be for uh, software services, software products, and hardware products. So if you go and check that out, it's a pretty detailed and lengthy report, has some good tools and guidebooks in it as well, very practical. Uh, We've also done a webinar on specifically how to procure technology uh, solutions that can be found in IFMA's uh, YouTube channel uh, there as well. That's open to everyone. It's an hour that goes into more detail on technology procurements. Um, and then another group that we'd recommend you to is the Center for Procurement Excellence. They do have a full 10-hour RFP basics, RFP 101 uh, training course. There'll be four of those offered for free. Uh, next year, starting with the first one in January. Uh, so if you have questions on how to sign up for that, happy to, to get you in touch there and reserve you a spot. Uh, and they also have a free web series of Ask the RFP Doctor every month, the third Thursday of the month that does quick tips, very similar format to this. Uh, Thank you for joining us for today's session of Ask the FM Doctor. Be sure to mark your calendars now and join our next webinar at 12 p.m. Central Time on the third Tuesday of the month. We look forward to seeing you again.